again, I'm, I'm amazed to have people from all over the world. That's really great. Um, I am uh, actually um, presenting, looking out of a window where our, the beginning of 20 inches of snow is starting to fall. So it's a little bit different here than um, you've got down there in Texas, and I imagine other places as well, but um, it's nice to be able to reach you like this. So what Andrea asked me to do was to um, craft sort of a holistic um, talk on uh, sulfur dioxide use. Um, I'm going to start with some basics, which um, hopefully will bring in anyone who is uh, new to winemaking and will be a nice reminder for those of you who've been doing this for a while. I don't know about you, but I've been working in wine for 20 years and I still have to go back and review some of the basics and, and especially SO2 sometimes because it's really not fun to think about, um, but it's so important that we do it right. So um, I'm going to start with that, talk about um, what we know about, you know, sort of um, uh, adding wine, uh, sulfur to wines, I'll, I'll give you um, uh, sort of a model um, way uh, to think about managing your SO2 in the winery. And then if we have time, I'll talk a little bit about the pros and cons of different ways of measuring SO2. And I apologize, any equipment and stuff like that are, are really gonna be US centric because I didn't realize we had um, an international audience. So I um, will just give you that warning ahead of time. That said, let's get started. Um, and let's start at the beginning. Um, let's see, Andrea, I don't seem to be able to uh, advance my slides. There we go. Sorry about that. Uh, so sulfur dioxide um, has been used for all kinds of preservatives since ancient times. We are all familiar with dried apricots that are nice and bright pink. Um, if we don't use SO2, or excuse me, orange, if we don't use SO2, they tend to, to brown and not look this vibrant. Um, so it has a long history and, and subsequently is, is generally accepted as, as safe, although we do know there are people with um, sensitivities in a much smaller group who have allergies, but it is still the best that we found um, to keep wine fresh and uh, free of microbes, so it's commonly used. It started being used in wine as a preservative in the 1700s um, in various forms and has been used ever since. Um, we probably all know, but in case you don't, um, sulfur dioxide is produced by yeast. Uh, in most fermentations, it's between 10 and 30 parts per million. Um, and in the United States, you know, we've got a label if we've got 10 parts per million or above. So it's a relatively low level um, at which we have to acknowledge that this is in there. Um, and there's certainly now, I'm, as many of you probably know, there are... Um, uh, yeasts that have been um, cultured so that they are capable of producing higher amounts of SO2 um, for organic producers and others who do not want to add exogenous SO2. So there's a range, but generally most strains are producing between 10 and 30 parts per million. We like to use SO2 for its three primary actions in wines. The first is that it's an antimicrobial. Um, which simply means that it inhibits the growth of bacteria and it inhibits the growth of some yeast. And I'm sure you all know this as well, but it's always good to remind ourselves that it does not kill bacteria and yeast, it just inhibits it. And that inhibition can vary depending on, you know, the strength of the culture and other uh, exogenous factors, temperature, um, other things like that. So antimicrobial, the first important function of SO2. The second important function is that it's an antioxidasic, which means that it can inactivate oxidation enzymes. So the enzymes that start to turn our fruit brown when we cut it and it's exposed to air, um, that's why we get that nice vibrant orange color in those dried apricots. Um, it's put on salad bars sometimes to keep um, lettuce from starting to turn brown around the edges. Um, so polyphenolic oxidases and other enzymes that cause browning are inhibited. And finally, it's an antioxidant. Um, it doesn't interact directly with the oxygen, but it scavenges hydrogen peroxide, that H2O2, that's formed during oxygen reactions. So it doesn't stop the oxidation chain from starting, but it halts it um, at, a, at a production step along the way so that we don't get damage um, from the rest of that oxidation chain occurring. So we um, like it because it's antioxidasic, antimicrobial, and antioxidant. Now, in addition to those three anti-activities, um, it also is a binder. 
um, SO2 binds with oxidation products like acid aldehyde to prevent them from reacting further with other things in the wine. So acid aldehyde, of course, is that characteristic uh, nutty, um, sherry-like aroma uh, that we find in oxidized wines, and it binds with that to prevent that from uh, continuing to be a problem. So the most important of, um, well, there, there are two primary things we need to remember about forms of sulfur dioxide that are used in wine. Um, the first is the three types of species, of chemical species that we find. Um, the molecular sulfur dioxide at the top of the chart here, that SO2 um, AQ formula that you see, um, has the most effective antimicrobial action. Uh, unfortunately for us, the concentration in wine is generally quite small. Um, it's uh, generally between 6 and 0.6%, um, and that is um, uh, variable depending on pH and other things. Um, there also is the bisulfite species, which has some antimicrobial activity, although it is not nearly as effective as the molecular. Also anti-browning, it binds with acid aldehyde and binds with anthocyanin. So that's where we get that binding activity. And um, the binding with anthocyanins, of course, can cause a slight reduction in color, um, which is why we try not to add way too much SO2 to our red wines. Uh, but um, the concentration in wine of the bisulfite species is quite high, between 94 and 99.4%. So we don't have to worry much about that. Uh, there's also the third species, the sulfite species, which acts as an antioxidant. For the most part, we don't have that uh, in, SO in uh, wines because the pH is uh, inappropriate for that. And I will um, show you, uh, I'll give you a little bit more information about that. Um, uh, Andrea, I am getting notes just to me in the chat that people are not getting the audio and I can't do anything about that at the moment. So I'll just uh, pass that along to you. Sorry Thank you. Everyone else. Sure. All right. So we've got these three species, molecular, bisulfite, and sulfite. And the distribution of these sulfur dioxide species varies with pH. So if you look at this chart here, um, lots of pretty colors. Um, the SO2 is this blue line, as you can see, that goes down as wine pH goes up. Um, oh my, sorry. Um, the SO3, which I mentioned we don't have a lot of, starts to, wow, I apologize for this. I don't know what's going on here starts to go up um, as our pH gets higher. So we don't start to see really um, noticeable amounts of that until pH six. And then um, this HSO3, which we know is there in the highest proportion, um, really starts to peak um, as we get towards pH four. So for my wine region where we're harvesting um, Riesling in cool climates, our pHs are often around 2.9 to well, maybe 3.4. Hopefully we don't go much higher than 3.4. Um, but I know that in warm climates like Texas, um, that you often can harvest with pHs at four or above, which um, scares me in my cold, <laughs> cold uh, wine region, uh, uh, winemaker's heart. But there are ways to deal with that. So I wanted to specifically mention that it's important to remember that what you've got available is pH dependent. And as you get closer to that pH four, um, you are really losing a lot of your protection. Um, so I would uh, propose this adjusted chart for those of you who are working, especially with reds in, in Texas and other warm areas, that your molecular SO2 is 0. 0.000 something, I don't know. It's quite low if you are getting to four, um, point, or four pH or above, which means that you're not getting very much antimicrobial action from your SO2 additions at all. So please be aware of that and realize that if you're reading sort of um, manuals that give you recommendations for average additions, that you're going to have to bump that up because your pH is, is higher than average um, for the purpose of most textbooks. That said, um, there are some other things that you can use to help um, prop up your SO2 and cover that antimicrobial function. Uh, you know, the browning and um, binding functions are going to be covered with the bisulfite, which you will have plenty of. One of them is lysozyme. 
which is now available approved by the TTB. Um, you can buy it commercially. I got this picture from uh, the catalog at, at Guzmer. So Guzmer, Scott Labs, um, pick your vendor. Uh, you, can, you can find this available. Lysozyme inhibits lactic acid bacteria. So you can see in these two pictures here on the left, the lactobacilli are, are quite active still. And on the right, the yeast remain, but those lactobacilli have all just like shriveled up and are, are dead and they're no longer active, but your yeast remains um, active and able to complete your fermentation. So in must, um, there are certainly a range of recommended additions. It's generally between 100 and 150 parts per million. The spec sheets for any product that you get should explain that. And if it doesn't, feel free to call the vendor. That's their job to help you figure that out for your particular uh, needs. Um, if you have volatile acidity that is caused by lactic acid bacteria, and you smell it, you can do an immediate treatment with 250 to 350 parts per million that will knock back that lactic acid bacteria and stop further formation of volatile acidity. It will not, of course, get rid of anything that's already been produced. And lysozyme will not affect acetic acid bacteria, which also causes VA. So it only is gonna help you with that lactic acid bacteria, the LABs. Um, another option uh, to help um, provide some backup for your SO2 additions and high pH wines are chitosans and um, chitin glucan. These are polysaccharides that have been derived from Aspergillus nigus, which is pictured here. This is the same um, uh, fungi species that um, companies use to uh, produce um, the enzymes that we add sometimes uh, in, in wine processing. So it's a source that you're familiar with if you've used other yeast additives. Um, these polysaccharides are, are related. They have um, their different commercial products that offer slightly different types of protection. So make sure that you either talk to your vendor or read the product specs. Um, no Breton side is one. There's also, I think, Baculess. There are a few others. Um, depending on the product, they are effective against Britannomyces species, so you can keep that from forming. If you already have Britannomyces in your wine, it will knock out the yeast, but it will not remove any um, of the off aromas, the, the guaiacol, the, the four ethylphenols that have already been formed. So those will remain, although you won't get further formation. Um, it also can knock out both Acetobacter and the lactic acid species. So those are some antimicrobial sort of boosts that you can use. Um, to help uh, when you've got high pH and the SO2 isn't going to quite do enough. So, um, so in addition to the important, the three important species, there are also two forms of SO2 that are important. And I promise you, I've been using this analogy before I knew I was going to speak to um, Texans, so I did <laughs> not uh, pick the horses up just for you guys. Um, but we've got the free SO2 and we've got the bound SO2. So the species that are out moving about in the wine and are um, available to interact and those that are bound up to other compounds and therefore are providing no protection. So in addition to remembering molecular, your most important form of SO2, species of SO2, you've got to know the difference between free and bound forms. And this is a really nice way to visualize um, all of the SO2 and the SO2 that we can measure in a wine. Um, if you look over there on the far left, you can see that our molecular SO2 is just a small part of the overall free. As you saw on the chart, most of your free SO2 is that bisulfite, which is not giving us antimicrobial activity, although it's doing other things like binding. Then on the far right, we have got some SO2 that is bound to acetaldehyde so tightly that it is not going to come loose. Um, in any SO2 addition, uh, you are going to get some that is bound and is going to stay bound. But in between those two forms, we do have a pool of reversibly bound SO2, SO2 that's bound to sugars, anthocyanins, and proteins. And we don't know all the rules um, that um, dictate how this uh, reversibly bound SO2 is coming in and out of solution, but we do know that it can, as we have more free SO2, um, it some of it will become bound as we lose free SO2, some of the reversible will become unbound over time so that our total SO2, which you can see here at the top, includes our measurements of both free SO2 on the left and bound SO2 on the right. 
um, is an equilibrium. We are moving in between those. Um, and that's important to know because if we add a lot of free SO2 and it all becomes bound rapidly, it's not protecting our wines. So just knowing that you've added it isn't enough. You've got to keep an eye on it and know um, how much remains free. The free to bound ratio is greatly influenced by wine type. Um, there are all kinds of things, as I just showed you in the, the chart, that binds it. Um, this includes um, sugar, so wines that have more dissolved solids, which pretty much means that they have more sugar, is going to have a higher percentage of bound SO2. And there's nothing that you can really do about that. So you just need to know that sweet wines are not going to take the same um, addition of SO2 and give you the amount free that you would expect with a normal wine. Um, free SO2 requirements are another thing we have to keep an eye on. And I am showing you both the equation here to calculate it from measuring your um, molecular SO2 or figuring out your molecular SO2 and free SO2, um, excuse me, for figuring out your molecular SO2 from your free SO2, I suspect most of you don't want to do this calculation by hand. So I would recommend either eyeballing it with this chart or there are all kinds of digital calculators online that can help you do this. So if you measure your free and total SO2, it will do the calculation for you, which is a wonderful thing. Um, but in general, you can see that as our pH goes up, and this chart doesn't even hit four, <laughs> so um, that's something to remember. Um, but as our pH goes up, the amount of free molecular SO2 required to protect your wine goes up as well. So you need quite a bit more um, as you move from the two nines that we see here in our cold climate, cool climate Rieslings and you know, three, seven, three, eight. Um, the two numbers that you see here, the blue line being 0 0.6 milligrams per liter and the pink 0 0.8 reflect um, the general recommendations for a still uh, dry white wine and the still dry red wines. So we'll talk about that in a little more detail. So um, you can find this chart gosh, just do a Google search and you'll be able to find it. But I'm sure Andrea can give you a copy if that's of interest. So this is just another way to look at it um, in, in chart form instead of looking at that graph. Um, but you can see again, to achieve five parts per million molecular SO2 at a pH of 2.9, you need much less uh, smaller addition than you do at four. Um, that's, that's quite a difference from 6.7 to 77.9. Um, parts per million. And parts per million, by the way, is also milligrams per liter for, for folks who aren't used to measuring that way. So milligrams per liter is what we're talking about throughout here. All right, so let's talk about additions. Um, when we're thinking about the additions that we want to make and we're uh, setting up our SO2 management strategy, we need to consider the type of wine that we're making. I've already discussed sweet wines and also white or red, and also your stylistic goals. Um, if you are making a wine that needs to age for a long time and probably won't be opened immediately, you can put a little more SO2 in there to protect that wine than if you are making a screw cap white wine that's going to be drunk on average within the first three months of um, release. Um, you put too much SO2 in that one, it's gonna blow people away. And we've actually seen that happen um, in some cases. So as I mentioned, um, white and red are different. White is almost always going to need more SO2 um, than red because the reds are less prone to oxidation. There are other things in the red wine, of course, the polyphenolics, the tannins um, that protect it from oxidation um, and also that bind SO2. So additions can be lower in general. Uh, we also often desire malactic fermentation uh, in red wine processing and generally, not always, but generally don't in white. So a higher uh, concentration of free SO2 is gonna be necessary um, pretty early on in your white processing to prevent that from happening where in the red, it's not as big of a deal. Sugar um, concentration, I mentioned earlier, um, sweet wines are going to need more SO2 than dry wines because there's so much more binding capacity. Also, because you got the sugar in there, there's a greater chance of microbial growth. So you're going to have to um, add more SO2 to protect it depending on alcohol level and other things. 
pre-fermentation. I'd like to go now through um, each step of uh, the winemaking process and we can talk about um, requirements and, and recommendations at each point. So prior to fermentation with white wines, generally we recommend adding 30 to 50 parts per million and this is just your addition. We're not talking about free molecular. We're just adding 30 to 50 parts per million of addition after crush. Now, the caveat for that is if you have high phenolic content in your white wines, and I've heard that that is the case um, for many of you producing whites in Texas, um, you may not want to do this because you might want some oxygen um, involvement early on in that process in order to get some of those phenolics to, to precipitate and drop out of solution. So if that's your goal, softening up that wine, um, removing some of those phenolics, you probably don't want to make an SO2 addition early on. It will turn brown, maybe be scary, but that will clear up later. So that's something to think about. Also, if you want spontaneous fermentation, um, you don't want to add SO2 uh, early on because that will prevent the, the indigenous yeast from doing their job. Uh, this is a picture that my colleague Denise Gardner took when she was the enology extension um, expert at PSU, Pennsylvania State University. And you can see here, it's just a really nice uh, comparison of the same white wine, white juice, where she added SO2 on the left and didn't on the right. You can see that the wine has turned brown. Um, this is the polyphenol oxidase occurring. Um, and you can see the difference that the inhibition makes uh, adding SO2 this early in white wines will protect the fruity floral aromas. So again, it's a stylistic question. If you are really going for a bright, fresh, fruity white wine that's going to be drunk early, you probably want SO2 earlier. If you're doing Chardonnay or other things, um, you don't necessarily need to do that. Again, we're talking about the phenolics. Uh, it also, of course, prevents unwanted malactic fermentation, which I touched on earlier. With red wines, we don't need quite the same level of addition, uh, 25 to 50 parts per million after crush, if you're doing a maceration, is what I would generally recommend. It really just knocks back microbial growth a little bit. Um, you're at greater risk for acetic acid formation, um, acetobacter and gluconobacter acting on that because you've got all those solids in there and often have so much oxygen so much air contact with your open fermenters. So it's a good idea just to sort of knock that back a little bit. Um, but this SO2 addition will be rapidly absorbed by cap components. It's pretty much going to be gone by the time the fermentation's going strong and the, it's producing CO2 to, you know, to, to blanket the tank. Um, it's not going to inhibit malactic fermentation at that level uh, because it goes away so quickly. So that's pre-fermentation for white and red. Post-fermentation for white, now instead of just thinking about total additions, we have to start paying attention to that free molecular. Uh, and post-fermentation, when you've got whites in storage or aging, um, unless you're doing malactic fermentation, of course, the recommended level is the 0 0.8 parts per million. So that's when you would check your pH, look at that chart, read your free SO2, and figure out what your parts per million is. This, again, will continue to prevent Malactic fermentation and other microbial issues will keep that wine fresh and clean and will pre prevent against oxidation and browning that we don't want. With red wines, again, because you've got phenolics and other compounds in there that help protect the wine, 0 0.5 parts per million free molecular is generally what we recommend for storage and barrel and other things. So a little bit lower. It's important to remember during storage, oh, excuse me, um, <laughs> uh, you do have some nitrogen depletion for malactic fermentation, which gives um, an additional protection to red wines because there isn't as much uh, food for any bad microbes to eat. Malactic kind of goes in and cleans out the fridge. Um, so it is certainly not sterile by any means, but it will prevent some things from, from establishing colonies. Um, and you just need less protection from for oxidation because of those phenolics. Uh, SO2 levels do diminish over time, so you can't just add it and forget it. Um, for this reason, um, you need to measure throughout. I'll talk about a strategy for that in a minute. And then pre-bottling, you want a free SO2 of 0 0.7 to 0 0.8 parts per million in white wines. Uh, the SO2 may be perceptible at 0 0.8 parts per million. So again, consider your closure 
and consider your release date. If this is a white wine that isn't going to be drawn right after release, um, you can go a little higher, but if it is too high, especially with a, a low pH wine, um, 0 0.7 to 0.8 might actually be too high. Uh, you might actually have perceptible SO2 that people will find off-putting. With reds, um, again, free SO2, 0 0.5 parts per million is what we're aiming for going into bottle. Uh, generally, reds have higher pH that prohibit you from getting anywhere near 0 0.8 parts per million. Even if you wanted to, the, the, it would be, the free edition would be so high that it would be um, detrimental to, to quality. Um, and again, if you've got warm climate, higher pH to begin with, it's going to be hard to get that high. At bottling, we also, for the first time, really think in some detail about total SO2. The general recommendation is that it should be around 100 parts per million or less total. So that's free versus plus bound. Um, that's primarily because when total gets higher than that, even if a lot of it's bound, there can be some sensory um, some off aromas that start to develop. Usually that's not a problem unless you're dealing with sweet wines. That's when you can sometimes get so much bound up that um, what's free is no longer adequate to protect the wine. So you have to be a little more careful when you're making additions to sweet wines. So let's talk about bottling. We just talked right up until bottling and where we want to be, but bottling is a big problem. Uh, bottling is probably the most problematic place for us um, when it comes to managing our SO2. Um, there's a large liquid surface area during fill. That wine is splashing around. I know we think we're pulling a vacuum, but it is really a partial vacuum and a very partial vacuum at that. There is still a whole lot of oxygen going on unless you've got you know, a very you know, a closed system with positive pressure. Um, there's also a very high ratio of headspace to liquid in the bottle during that fill. You've been keeping it pretty well managed in um, a full tank or barrel, but once you've got it splashing around in a bottle, you suddenly have a much greater uh, exposure to, to oxygen. And we're looking at sequential operations. We're putting this poor wine through a pump, and then we're putting it through filters, and then we're splashing it around. It's being abused um, all sorts of ways. So it's uh, oxygen pickup can be quite high. What it really comes down to, and what I'd like you to consider, is that bottling is your absolute last chance to check your wine for sensory and chemical characteristics, and then you're going to send it out in the world, and your little babies have to fend for themselves, and you really want them to reach your consumers in the same state that you put them out to the world. So um, the bottle and the closure that you use are the only defense that it has for spoilage. So it's important to understand going in um, what levels you have. It's really important if you own your own bottling line to run some tests and see how much oxygen pickup you get over the course of bottling. Um, and that can help you make good decisions uh, for getting a stable product. Um, I think talk briefly about oxygen in wines. Um, oxygen saturation is eight milligrams per liter. And what we're really looking for um, uh, is below 0 0.5 milligrams per liter in a white wine and below one milligram per liter in a red wine. So full on splashing, if I take a glass of wine and throw it in a, um, a pitcher and shake it up as hard as I can, I can get up to 80 milligrams per liter in there. 80 milligrams per liter of oxygen will eat up 32 parts per million of free SO2. That's a lot. and we don't want that to happen. So um, if you have the capability, whatever bottling system you're using um, to check oxygen before and after and see how much change you're getting, it's worth doing. Now, post bottling, we need to think a little bit about our closures. Um, if this, uh, <laughs> this collection of, of rectangles um, represents the two walls of a bottleneck and the cork, the yellow closure in between, the first thing that happens at bottling is that um, oxygen um, that is in the quirk is rapidly expelled from the, the cells in that quirk into the wine. So you're going to get a, the wine bottle, the headspace. You're going to get a little bit of oxygen from those cells that squishes out uh, as we squeeze it into the bottleneck. But then we have the potential for oxygen permeation 
through the sides and or the body of the closure. Um, so that's what we want to think about, um, what kind of closures we have and what kind of oxygen we're getting in when we plan the amount of SO2 that we put in a wine to help it hold up um, following bottling. And this collection um, of uh, oxygen ingress post bottling was put together by my colleagues Gavin Sachs and Chris Gerling. Um, it is a little bit old, it's from 2009. And so this reflects the best um, uh, information that we had at the time. But if you look here um, at the left, this red line is a synthetic cork. Um, so Noma cork, Supreme cork, the oxygen pickup when they measured it was 3.5 milligrams per year. That is all coming in, if you look back here at this last one, that's all coming in the side of the closure between the wall of the bottle and the cork because it doesn't have the sort of ruptured cells that serve as suckers to glom on to the side of the bottle like a natural cork would. So the synthetics that were available in 2009 really had pretty high oxygen pickup over time which meant that um, the wine was going to quickly um, use up a whole lot of free SO2 and start to oxidize unless it was drunk quickly. Um, natural quirks, you can see is this white dotted line. You get oxygen pickup right after bottling. Part of that is because we're expressing that oxygen from the cork into the headspace, and then it stables off. It levels off over time. Um, one to two milligrams in the first year, and then really not very much. So um, that oxygen, uh, the cork is a pretty nice, if, if we're, uh, it's sound cork and our storage conditions are right, we don't get oxygen moving into the bottle for the most part. Technical corks, which then are the you know natural corks that have been ground up and um, glommed back together with glue. Oxygen pickup is a little bit lower in the first year, and like the natural cork, it levels off, so you don't get oxygen ingress. And then screw caps, um, this blue dotted line, screw caps stay stable over time, very minimal oxygen pickup. So if you're adding the amount of SO2 to a screw capped wine that you've always added to the wine when you bottled it in synthetic, you can see how that could potentially be a problem. So consider what kind of cork you're using. And I will, before any synthetic uh, cork companies um, come after me, I will say again, this was from 2009. They um, say that they have improved that uh, ingress I haven't seen the data, but you can request it if you have any concerns about that. So now we've walked through all the different ways we can, um, when we want to add SO2, um, I'd like to talk about the forms of SO2 additives. And the most common form is potassium metabisulfite. We tend to abbreviate that as KMBS. Um, and the most important thing to remember about KMBS is that only 57% of that powder that you're dissolving into your solution is available as SO2. The rest of it is the K, it's other stuff. So you've got to make your calculations carefully with that in mind. So you can't just add, you know, 100 parts per million of this stuff and think that it's all SO2. We generally dissolve it in warm water prior to addition. That's because it isn't stable in a liquid form. Um, so we keep it in a dry form um, because it stays stable a lot longer, mix it up when we need it, and usually acidify with a little citric acid to make sure it goes into solution. Um, all of this information you can find uh, in your favorite lab analysis book, but I just wanted to show you as a reminder, again, we're taking the wine in gallons multiplying by 3.785 by your parts per million addition. So what we're trying to do is, um, for whatever reason in the US, we're measuring our volume in gallons and then um, making our additions in grams. So we've got to convert that. Um, so this 3.785 converts our grams to liters. That 1,000 converts parts per million to grams per liters because we don't want to we don't want to measure milligrams per liters usually. And then that 0.576 concentration of SO2 and KMBS, that's your conversion factor, so that you're actually adding what you want in SO2 um, rather than in KMBS. So that gets you down to this wine in gallons times your parts per million of addition times 0 0.066, which takes into account all these conversion factors, gives you your grams of KMBS um, to add. And I would really, if you aren't already, I would really uh, urge you to start thinking in metric terms when you're doing additions and anything else, because we do that in the scientific community and we do that in the rest of the winemaking world. Uh, so it's just easier when you're reading um, what other people are doing. 
So um, we, after many requests from our uh, consumers around the state, have put together this guideline, this strategy for SO2 management that I want to share with you. Um, at the time that you are going to make an SO2 analysis or an SO2 addition, um, first measure your SO2 in the wine, also measure your pH, use that calculator that I showed you and calculate an addition, make your addition, and then measure that SO2 again in 24 hours. Your pH isn't gonna change, but the SO2 might. So measure it in 24 hours. If the SO2, excuse me, hasn't changed hugely, if you saw a huge drop, you might need to add some more. If not, go back and measure it again in one week. If after one week, your free SO2 concentration has decreased by more than five parts per million, and this isn't free molecular, this is free. If you've got a decrease of more than five parts per million, you might wanna start over. Measure it again, measure your pH, calculate a new addition, because a lot has been bound up and you perhaps are not getting the protection you want. If that decrease is less than five parts per million, then we need to think about what kind of tank you've got. If your tank is full stainless steel, if it's stainless steel and is full, let me put it that way, you've got a full stainless steel tank, wind all the way up into the manway, then you can check your SO2 monthly. And if at any point it drops less than five parts per million, then you probably need to think about making an addition. So every month, take a sample, check your SO2, measure your pH. If your tank is either variable capacity stainless steel or is a polymer, even if it's full because polymers allow gas uh, ingress, then check your SO2 every two weeks. See what that free SO2 concentration is. And if the decrease is greater than five parts per million, you need to go back and, and think about adding some more. Now, this doesn't mean that, it, you know, if you see a decrease of five parts per million, I wouldn't then, you know, absolutely go in and, and make a new addition, but I would keep an eye on that. I would start probably measuring it every week. And when that drops below, when your change is more than about 15 or 20 parts per million, that's when you know, need to go back in and make additions. We don't want to make additions at every five parts per million drop, but this is just a nice guideline to think about um, what the factors are and, and what you need to maintain. And I can send this as a handout to um, Andrea if she would like to, to share it with you. And of course, the problem is we have to get it just right, right? If we don't add enough, we have all the problems we talked about, oxidation, malactic fermentation, spoilage microorganisms, but when we add too much, and in my opinion, a lot of people add too much, we get that burnt match off odor. We get trigeminal irritation, you know, the burning in the back of the nose. And we get consumers who don't know that this is an SO2 addition problem and just think there's something wrong with your wine. So it's one of those do it just right, um, which is why we have to pay so much attention to all of these factors. So why should we measure SO2 and our pH? Mostly because it's really difficult to predict concentrations. Um, I've known a lot of winemakers over my 21 years in the wine industry who don't like to measure lots of things because they feel like they can kind of taste and smell and, and figure it out. And yeah, there's some things you can do that for. Wine balance, sugar, great. SO2, no. Because of the binding capacity, <clears throat> you really can't predict what's there just by tasting. Um, <clears throat> because of air exposure and changes in pH, um, it's hard to predict your concentrations over time. So we need to measure it. Um, there are also legal implications. And again, I apologize for our international audience. I'm primarily US focused here, but in the US, if you've got more than 10 parts per million uh, sulfites, you've got a label and this contains sulfites. In the US and Canada, our legal total limit is quite high. You would never want to get that high in a regular wine because it would stink. Um, but uh, remember one, one 10 parts per million total is probably what you want to see in a bottled wine. But you can see how high <clears throat> we can potentially go. But if you're exporting anywhere else, or if you just are concerned about wine quality, you probably want to go lower than that. So I'd like to, in the, the few minutes we have remaining, talk a little bit about the ways that you can measure SO2. Um, the primary ones are the ripper method, titrets, aeration oxidation, <clears throat> and segmented flow analysis. 
There are kits for enzymatic analysis of SR2. We generally don't recommend this because the accuracy is just low. Um, because SR2 changes so rapidly, it, it just tends to, to not be representative. So I would say don't go into that unless you're, well, just don't do it <laughs> is my recommendation. Um, you can argue with me if you'd like. So let's talk about Ripper method first. Um, the Ripper method is one of the most common ways that people measure SO2. Um, the theory is that <clears throat> we're titrating with iodine to a color endpoint. So it's a visual endpoint. Um, the iodine binds with the sulfites. And once it's bound with all the sulfites, it starts to bind with starch in the solution. And that forms a color. And that's when we see um, that uh, the SO2, the sulfite is all bound and we stop our titration. So that color change indicates the end of the titration. So the biggest problem with this, of course, um, is that we're making a visual judgment and we've got to make the same visual judgment exactly every time to be reproducible. For free SO2, um, you first acidify the wine because there are other components, um, polyphenolics um, and hydroxyl groups that can oxidize um, <clears throat> and then react with the SO2. Um, the starch titration gives you the color endpoint and then you add sodium bicarbonate to form carbon dioxide to prevent reactions with, with atmospheric oxygen so we can sort of uh, decrease the variability and get the color change that we want. For total SO2, we instead raise the pH with sodium hydroxide to favor the, the SO3 2 minus species, um, which releases the bound SO2. And then we can do the same thing that we just did for free. So you do the free and then you do this and, and basically you run the same thing again and you get a free and total number. So if you've run this, you're probably familiar with this. Um, you can see the titration here. There's your iodine in your burette. <clears throat> this is your acidified wine with the starch indicator and sodium bicarbonate. And you get this color endpoint um, after titration. And again, it takes, um, uh, it takes a good eye to stop at exactly the same color change every time. Um, so that always can add a little bit of unpredictability. Now, the big problem, of course, occurs when we're doing red wine, because this color change in the bottom two pictures is harder to see than it is with the white wine. So um, <clears throat> you can amend this a little bit by getting a strong LED light, like a little desk light from, you know, whatever your local box store is, shine that horizontally across this uh, wine, and that gives you a better idea of when the color change happens, but it, it makes it a little bit riskier. So it's a little bit harder to measure. And then there is a calculation that you use um, to convert all of your molarities and figure out what your milligrams per liter of SO2 are. Um, <clears throat> titrets are an encapsulated ripper method. I know a lot of people like these because they're so easy. You don't have to mess with all the chemicals and filling up the burette. Uh, it's basically a little titration happening <clears throat> in a little glass tube. It already contains the iodine and the acid solution. So you just suck the wine up um, into the, the solution um, and there's there are little gradations on the side that allow you to estimate SO2. You can see this is how it works. These are the little glass um, vials. You add the little plastic um, tube, suck up your wine and you get this color change and then you can turn it upside down and see the measurements. Um, I would absolutely only use this as um, a quantitative analysis or qualitative analysis rather than quantitative. It is not very accurate at all. It is really not accurate with red wine because it's really hard to see the color change here. So if you just need a quick check, um, it's okay, um, but I wouldn't use this as your primary method. Um, now there is also, I think Vinvation makes um, another type of ripper. Um, they have a little uh, um, analysis um, uh, unit um, that takes out some of the, the guesswork because you don't have to do the visual inspection to get the change. Um, but just understand that that vitivation is also ripper. Um, so it's not, it's, it's more accurate, but not the most accurate way to measure your SO2. Um, but that is a nice alternative to either the titrets or running the, um, the titration yourself by hand. The only problem is if that instrument is um, off calibration, it's not something that you can fix yourself. You have to call your vendor and you know, send it back or have someone repair it. So unless you are really familiar with it, you may not know when it's, it's giving you funny readings for a little bit. All right, the aeration oxidation method is the one that we, we recommend for the most accuracy in most wineries. However, it does take more time and more effort. Um, for free SO2, you acidify the wine, 
you drive the SO2 off with an airstream, trap that SO2 in hydrogen peroxide solution and a color indicator, which forms sulfuric acid, and then you titrate that sulfuric acid to a color endpoint. And for the bound SO2, you actually um, boil that wine to release bound species and run the same thing again. So once again, we're doing free and bound to get total. Um, the unit looks like this. You can see um, this is where we've put our acidified wine sample. It um, is pulling air in through here, goes up through the condenser. Um, this is our vacuum. And, and then we have a collection flask with hydrogen peroxide and, and color indicator. And that color change is what we look for. In order to do um, the bound SO2, we then add a heat mantle or some way to heat it here so that that boils. And this is just another setup um, with a different kind of boiler flask. So it's a lot of glassware. It's not cheap glassware, but if you can master this, um, you will get sort of the best way, the most um, accurate SO2 um, that you can do bench top. Now there's another method that is available, oh, excuse me, and then, then you have a calculation for aeration oxidation that gives you your, um, your, your final SO2. So the pros and cons, um, that ripper, simple titration setup, if you're comfortable with titrations, it's pretty easy to do, it's quick, measures free in total. The red wine endpoint is hard to determine. It is time sensitive um, and it's a non-selective titration. So if there's ascorbic acid in your wine, that is going to throw off your measurement. Um, so if you add ascorbic for any reason, which some people do, uh, that is not good. The titrates, quick, easy. They're pretty expensive. I think they're now $1.20 a sample. They only measure free. Um, so again, it's a nice check, but I wouldn't use this as your primary method. And then aeration oxidation, most accurate, most precise, measures free and bound, and um, prevents interference with volatile acids or bases. You may have interference with volatile acids or bases. So if your VA is high, it may change your measurement. Um, you've got to buy that equipment and it is time intensive. It takes somebody to hang out in the, the lab and do it, which may not be the best use of your time, depending on what you wanna do. Now, the really best way at this point to measure SO2 is flow injection analysis. Um, for flow injection analysis, the acid is added to release the SO2. It diffuses over a small Teflon membrane, reacts with a yellow dye, and then there's a photometer that reads that color change. It's very, very accurate. It's very simple to run once it's set up. It's very expensive. Um, this is what it looks like. You can see on the bottom, um, a total SO2 and free SO2 unit. You have to have both units. And then the auto sampler, of course, is, is extra. But each of these two units costs $15,000. Um, it is very accurate. It can do up to 60 samples an hour. It's great if you run a big winery or have a big lab. The reason I show this to you is just that if you send your sample out for analysis, this is probably what they're going to do. So I wanted you to have an understanding of what, what it is um, and, and what it's doing and that it is really a much better um, analysis than AO, more accurate, but AO is perfectly adequate for what most people are doing in the winery. So with that, um, we are at time. Uh, I see we've been 50, about two minutes over. So the take home messages, um, uh, our first, that molecular SO2 is the most active species uh, at wine pH for oxidation. Um, and if our pH goes over four, we're in trouble because we don't have much molecular SO2 at all. Um, also, remember that SO2 exists in free and bound forms and that only free SO2 protects your wine. And pH measurements are essential to proper management. So if you don't know what your pH is, you really don't have an idea um, of what that SO2 is. Either too much or too little SO2 can cause major wine defects. So just adding it to the max in order to protect your wine um, is likely to, to bite you. Uh, make sure that you're actually balancing that with your stylistic goals. Think about um, amount of time in bottle, type of closure, and amount of soluble solids when you're thinking about SO2 additions. And remember that the levels always diminish over time, um, whether it's storage in a full tank or whether it's in the bottle, um, you always are going to have loss of SO2. So you need to plan ahead for that so that at the end point, whenever uh, you, you can get to, your wine life will, will last as long as it needs to um, in order to get you where you need to go. So with that, um, I just want to share you with you one addition calculator, uh, Vino Enology. If you um, Google that, they've got all kinds of calculators. Their SO2 addition calculator is quite good. Um, there are others. I'm have no stock in this particular one, but it's one that a lot of people use. 
Uh, and also want to just let you know that um, I'm with Cornell Enology Extension Education. Um, if you are interested in following us, uh, we do have some information sheets and other things on our webpage, which is here. Uh, and we're also on Facebook. Um, we occasionally post research um, that we think is interesting. We occasionally push out some of Andrea's posts as well. So um, you're welcome to look for us there too. Um, and with that, uh, I will take any questions. I believe Andrea is going to read them to me. Thank you. Yes, we have um, first question we had comes from Sandeep. Could you clarify what the 99.4% concentration in wine means? I believe he was referring to the yes. uh, different species of SO2. Yes. Um, so what I'm going to do, I will go back to that chart. So um, there are three types, three species of wines and at wine, three species of sulfur dioxide, molecular, which is what we want. We really want more of this than anything else, bisulfite and sulfite. And at wine pH between say two, eight and th four, let's say four, um, you're going to have a lot more of the bisulfite form than you are of the SO2 form that you want. So that bisulfite will give us some um, binding activity and some anti-browning activity, but not the antimicrobial activity that we look for. So if the pH is you know higher than four, um, you want to think about some other ways to handle your antimicrobial. Does that help? Sure, it did. Thank you. Um, a question from James. Um, I think he was referring to the study done by Dr. Sachs about oxygen ingress after bottling through closures. Were the bottles standing up or laying down? Um, to my knowledge, these bottles would have been, um, oh, I think that the synthetic and the screw cap were standing up because contact with wine is not desired in those cases. It's not that, you know, keeping the synthetic in contact with the wine would make it plump up. And then the, the cork ones were lying on their side as you would store corked wines. So it would be sort of under normal storage condition. I can check that. Um, one of the other authors who did great studies for this um, was the author's last name is Lopez, L-O-P-E-S. Um, he published a few papers that I don't have off the top of my head, but if you get in touch with Andrea, um, I could send those to you if you want to read a little bit more about it. Um, there's a question from Matt, I believe he, yeah, he's asking less or more. I'm not sure exactly to what he's referring. So maybe if he can clarify. <laughs> um, Always more. No, less or more, I don't know. I'm sorry. You may have been reacting to a specific thing I said that wasn't clear. So, uh, okay. Yeah. In the slide, when, about when to measure SO2, um, Anna did not talk about oak barrels. Can you talk a little bit about oak barrels. Yes. So um, the reason I didn't talk about oak barrels is because they're still, or at the time actually that I, I originally wrote this, there was still quite a bit of, of debate. Um, and a lot of people I feel like still treat it like um, stainless steel and they're going in every month and checking. We are starting to see some evidence that actually um, once that barrel is full and you leave it alone, even though the liquid level drops a bit, um, the, uh, um, the, the SO2 level stays solid. You're not getting oxygen in that tank uh, or in that barrel. It's a pretty stable system. So we actually find that apparently it looks like most of the oxygen that's being introduced happens when you pull open that bunk to check it. So if you can leave it, like if you put it to bed and leave it for, you know, three months, um, that might be fine. Now I'm hesitant to give you that as an absolute recommendation uh, because I hate to ruin your wine. Um, and I hate to be the scientist who's like, we don't know yet, we need more science. Um, but it's, opinions are moving towards interfere with it as little as possible. If when you put it in barrel, you know that your SO2 is good, uh, leave it. Um, if you're getting in there and doing batonage, of course, check it because you're introducing all kinds of air. Uh, but yeah, I would, I would even go out probably further than monthly, like you would with a full stainless steel, if you have a full barrel. And I suspect that, um, answered Megan's question who wrote, can you talk a little bit about the timing of SO2 additions, like small additions in barrel over time versus one or two large additions, um, just before bottling? 
I would always do larger additions if you can. It's not going to hurt anything and it's going to give you more protection. Every time you've got to interact with the wine, you're potentially introducing oxygen, microbes, anything else. So I am a big believer in interfering as little as possible um, to kind of leave it alone to do its thing. We have uh, two questions about um, total SO2. Does total SO2 decrease over time? And if yes, how can we explain that? Um, total, well, total SO2 is, is free plus bound and free decreases over time. So total decreases over time. Is your question whether bound decreases over time? And the answer to that is it depends um, because some of it is permanently bound to acetaldehyde and some of it is in that um, that uh, uh, lesser, uh, the equilibrium stage where it can go in between bound and free because it's bound to something other than acetaldehyde like sugars. Um, and that's hard to predict because that binding mechanism is much harder to sort of, um, the variables are harder to understand and to measure. Okay. So Matt clarified his question. It was about the analysis flow slide, the last check for SO2, less or more in the analysis uh, flow. In this slide, less or more. I suppose. Um, Ooh, Matt, I'm not sure what you're asking. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I, I, maybe what I said, uh, Matt, can you type your question again? Less or more? When, what? Okay. Does free and bound SO2 diminish over time? You already addressed that. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> At, there was a question about um, SO2 management in rosé wines. And, well, it was more of a comment uh, rather than a question. Um, can you address that at all? I think the person who asked the question said it, it can be a presentation in in and of itself. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I think on broadly, on broad terms, um, rosé kind of has to be somewhere between red and white because you don't have as, uh, as many of the the factors in red wine that will protect the wine from oxidation and you want to keep more fruity wines, but you don't want to kill the color um, by adding too much SO2. So I would sort of aim towards more like a white treatment than a red. Um, but yes, I could be a whole talk. Uh, I see Matt is actually asking, I believe Matt is asking about this block, um, the decrease in, in um, if the decrease is less than five parts per million. So what I was trying to say here, Matt, is that um, check your free SO2 concentration and your choices are, um, let me do this actually. If your decrease is greater than five parts per million, you need to go back and measure. If your decrease is less than five parts per million, then you think about what kind of tank you have. So if that if, if this didn't happen, the alternate is that it didn't decrease that much. So check your tank. Um, my my take home point here is that at any time you check and you've seen a, a decrease of more than five parts per million in two weeks or in a month, depending on what tank type you is, you need to keep an eye on it keep checking it every week and then if that um if you if you dropped 15 to 20 parts per million that's when i would actually go back and make the addition all right wesley says at a very low ph a small amount of free so2 is required is this amount adequate for oxidation and other protection from so2 besides microbial um yes it should it should hit everything um, because the activity is all there. Okay. Because you've got so much of this bisulfite, I, I imagine that, that that's what your question is because it, uh, you know, you've got less of this bisulfite form, there's still so much of it that it's you're hitting the acetaldehyde and browning. Mm -hmm. Can mm -hmm. the bound SO2 be considered as some kind of reservoir of SO2 that will be slowly released or is it too hard to predict to be considered? It's too hard to predict to be practical. Mm -hmm. um, how much influence does storage temperature if affect free SO2? Um, oh, that's a great idea. Um, in general, the warmer it is, the more things are going to outgas. Um, I have not seen any studies of that. 
So I, I can't give you exact numbers, but cold storage is always, you know, in any chemical situation, cold storage is going to keep everything slow. So the colder you can hold things, the less chemical reactivity you've got going on. Geraldine asks, when you say large additions, how much is large? Well, it depends on what you need. But as I mentioned earlier, when I was saying, okay, maybe you've got, you, you dropped five parts per million, but I wouldn't go in and add, you know, whatever you need for five parts per million. Um, I would wait until you were going to add 20 parts per million. Um, it, it really depends on your specific wine type. But I think what I was generally trying to, to say was that I wouldn't sort of add a little bit and wait and add a little bit. I would estimate, calculate what you, you are going to need and add it all at once. Can you please show the slide again on the summary of why to measure SO2 and pH? Yes, I would be glad to. And I believe that um, Andrea is gonna have this available as well. Okay. So you should be able to go back and look at it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if there was a follow-up question after this, but this is a slide. Um, a question from Bob, is full stainless tank the same as full floating lid? No, it is not. Um, if you think about what's going on with the volume, the air uh, um, uh, exposure in a full tank, you've got, you know, if the wine is all the way up into the manway at the top of a stainless steel tank, you've got what, maybe a little bit bigger than a dinner plate or a trash can lid mm -hmm. of, of air exposed to your wine. With that variable capacity tank with a lid, um, there are two issues. The first is that that lid often is flat and when the wine is rising up in it, the lid is never exactly flat. So there are always air bubbles trapped in there. The other issue is um, even the most conscientious winemaker who is checking that seal of the variable capacity lid all the time sometimes gets uh, failures and you've got air coming in around the, the outside. So we, we sort of conceptually treat a variable capacity stainless tank the same way we would with a plastic tank and that we know there's going to be some some air ingress um, and we would treat that as short-term storage rather than long-term storage of a wine that you want to age because you just it's not going to be as protected. Um, so we have two more questions. Anna Catherine, are you okay sure. for a few more minutes? Yes, okay. I am. Um, how does the practice differ with sparkling wine that coming from Fiona? <laughs> um, that's an excellent question. Um, and I am not an expert on sparkling wine. So I apologize for saying that I, I'm not prepared to talk about that in any detail. However, um, if you would like to email me, I can get you in touch with, with people who do research on that, who could give you more specific recommendations. Um, another question, oops, um, coming from Huo, um, how do you manage SO2 in a winery where wine temperatures drop to 10 degrees Celsius in the winter and rise to 30, not 32 degrees Celsius in the summer? <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry about that. That sounds like fun. Um, I, I, I think I would be checking it more often just to keep on top of it. Um, you're going to have to, because anytime you have that big of a, a temperature change, you, you, you're going to have things changing in the wine. Is there a difference in wine quality caused by too much free SO2 versus too much bound SO2? Yes. I mean, too much free SO2, um, you, you, you've all experienced this. I think you've noticed it. It flows off, it burns. Um, the having too much total SO2 seems to be more insidious. It's more of sort of a background off flavor aroma. Um, I haven't seen a really good study that defined the, the characteristics specifically. It's just sort of something that we empirically know. Um, when you see high bound, um, you, you notice some of these sort of, I don't know, uh, mouthfeel kind of uh, taste sensations that aren't pleasant. Um, that would be a good study, actually. But it's also, remember, it's not like you have a choice between having too much free or too much bound. It's just that that free is going to be immediately apparent and it's going to knock your socks off and make your eyes water um, and will flow off a little bit, whereas that that bound is is not going to blow off if the glass sits um, and is, is going to kind of just be icky. 
for a very technical term. Kind of. <laughs> Um, question from Caesar um, or Cesar: Is there any recommended strategy to diminish excess of free SO two when an excessive addition was made? Yes, um, there are, uh, and we can point you to those resources. I, I um, we're running out of time to to go through that whole process, but um, either Andrea or I can can give you protocols for that. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there's one more question here, but I'm struggling to see it completely. I don't know why. Um, Our computers are not cooperating with us today. <laughs> yeah, that's just the, the second line of the question doesn't show. When analyzing with Ripper and a pH meter, some people say to end, I suppose it's the difference in pH endpoints. Um, um, oh, but I don't see the end of the question. I cannot read the full question. I think well, and, and and we're kind of out of time, but please, um, um, I uh, Andrea has my email address, mm -hmm. um, and certainly she can answer many of these questions as well. So I would say, please feel free to email us. I hope that's okay, Andrea, that I just yeah, put you out there. No, no, absolutely. <laughs> and um, quickly, um, um, will the slides be available? Can I send out the PPT to um, the people who attended? Um, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Maybe as PDF form, because they're kind sure. of uh, yeah, yeah. image heavy, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. yep. All no, right, it's just fine. All right, well, thank you very much, um, Anna Catherine, for a wonderful, um, really informative presentation. Thank you to everyone who attended. A quick um, um, favor, please, please fill out the survey that will pop up at the end of the webinar. Um, it helps uh, my program continue. Mm -hmm. So um, please take one minute to fill out the five questions in the survey. I would greatly appreciate that. And with that, I wish you all a good day and I will see you next time. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks, you all. Thank you, Andrea. And I'd also like to thank um, Seth Urbanek, who uh, talked to me ahead of time and sort of clued me into what was going on in the Texas industry. So everyone have a great weekend. Bye-bye.